mistake of uh, inviting an activist to address you. <laughs> so I apologize that I may not uh, sound business-like because uh, that is not really my, my life experience. I thank you for this opportunity to share some insights uh, on the important issue of sustainability through responsible business. I'd like to acknowledge the lady who just introduced me. She is one of those who you feel proud that these young people, young women who are taking the center stage and they're becoming the face of African women in the world. Futi, we are very proud of the work you are doing both with the United Nations and also here back home. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, your presence here and we thank you for gracing our, our day with the, our business community here. The world still is reeling from the economic crisis. In Africa, as in the rest of the world, it came upon us sharply and curbed the impressive growth that our economies have been experiencing, experiencing over the past decade. But recent reports show that African economies are not only recovering, but recovering faster than in other parts of the world. In fact, 80% of African countries had positive growth in 2009, compared with only 10% of OECD nations. As we move forward, let us take a moment to reflect on what we as a global community and specifically as Africans have learned from our recent global economic challenges. While economic growth rates around the continent are beginning to recover, the vast majority of Africans are not benefiting. Income gaps are growing and more and more people are unable to assess even the most basic necessities of life. We simply cannot continue to move ahead while so many, many people, actually millions of our people are being left behind. If only we watched the indicators of life like we do the indicators of our economy or the value of our currency. If we only were as quick to act when we realized that one in 16 African women are dying in pregnancy or birth child, the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. HIV AIDS is the number one cause of death of women of childbearing age, and the disproportionate numbers of women and girls are illiterate and unable to attend school. To our own detriment, African nations continue to exclude two major groups from participating in our economy, in our political life, and social growth. The first group is women. African women are no victims. They have a long history of leadership on this continent from the old days of the Ashanti queens and who fought for the slave traders through market women who claim their space as the economic back or backbone of their nations. Despite this, African women have been prevented from accessing land, capital, financial systems, services, I'm sorry, that they need to thrive. Financial institutions do not have the systems in place to scale up and enroll women entrepreneurs. Banks often require unreasonable collateral, fail to recognize women's skills and motivation, and do not provide the level of business development support that women need. On a broader level, macroeconomic reform often continue to marginalize the poor in general and poor women in particular. That's why some of us started a movement in which we create a network of women in finance to try to influence two main directions. One, to get women climbing into the decision making within the financial institutions. And second, working with financial institutions to identify 
and remove obstacles which are making it difficult for women to get assets to capital as entrepreneurs, as managers even, and even as investors. So we want to influence and change the landscape of the financial system as a door opening to get more and more women in different business to get capital and to become actually big, big business. Not only to strive in the so-called informal sector. The second group I'd like to draw your attention to is youth. Africa is a continent of young people. We are the youngest region of the world. 60% of us are below the age of 25. The challenges that face youth are just as diverse and unique as youth themselves. In 2007, only 50% of African youth were employed. They have been to secondary schools or for vocational training, and yet there are no jobs to meet them once they finish. Youth are being marginalized and are not being given the rightful place around the table. They are increasingly, increasingly becoming disengaged, disenfranchised, and angry. Our African economies need these young people. We cannot afford to forego the skills, contributions, energy of these essential groups within our society. Let me, let me put a bit of my written speech here and there, try to make my point. We have as societies two major in terms of majority. Women are 50% or sometimes 50% of our population. And as I said, youth are 60% of our population. And you look around and you realize even our institutions at parliament, at the decision-making bodies, they are mostly urban, middle-aged, and they make it. Rural people are not very much involved, and they are the third majority, actually, the third majority of our, of our people. So you have urban, middle-class, and middle-aged. We are youth. If 60% do not participate in the decision making, how do you take the interests on board and into account? Women, we in South Africa, we are one of the leading countries in terms of having women participating in the political life. The best one, as you know, is you, Rwanda. Some of the countries around here will participate in the liberation movement.